For this video, we'll be looking at how to read scientific journal articles. In particular, we will look at an example of a paper about dog walking in parks. Let's walk through all the parts of a scientific paper. On the left, you can see the name of the journal, biology letters, and the citation information at the top. Note the DOI number. Every published scientific article receives a DOI number, and if you know that number, you can easily find it. In the black bar, we see the specific topic for this article within the journal, animal behavior. Then we have the title. Historically, titles used to be more general or phrased as a question, but more recently, they have tended to become declarative statements. For example, 50 years ago, the title of this paper may have been Four-Legged Friend or Foe? Does Dog Walking Displace Native Birds from Natural Areas? Whereas now, it is a concrete statement. Then the authors are listed, and here you can see there are two, Banks and Bryant. In most fields, the order of the authors is by descending contribution, where the first name is the person who made the largest contribution, but this can vary by field. In evolution and genetics, for example, the most influential author may be either the first or last author, and the main professor for a research group is usually listed last. And in economics, apparently, there is a tradition of the author's names being listed alphabetically. Some journals also have specific statements included that specify the contributions of each author. Nevertheless, one of the authors will be noted as the corresponding author, and they will be someone who knows the study very well. In this situation, it looks like Peter Banks is the professor, and Jessica Bryant is his student, as will become clear by the end of the paper. The next part of the paper is the abstract, which is a short summary of the paper. This is commonly shown in search results on databases for journal articles, and is what generally convinces people whether they take the time to read the article or not. The length is limited by the journal, so only the most important points can be described here. Some journals also include a keyword section for SEO, search engine optimization. This is to help people find the article when they search specific keywords in databases and on search engine. Most journals limit the number of keywords you can use. The information on this slide is generally what people will see when they are first searching for a bunch of papers on a topic. What's here will convince them whether or not to look at the paper in more detail to see if it's really useful for their purposes. The first section of most articles is the introduction. Generally, the introduction starts very general, and in the first paragraph, it focuses down to the specific topic of the research paper, as you can see in the red box here. This paper starts with the very general statement about dogs being pets, and in just a few sentences, it focuses on the effects of dogs on wildlife. The goal of the introduction is to provide background on the general topic, and to convince the reader that there is an unanswered question that is interesting. The implication is then that this paper will answer that question. Generally, as we can see illustrated in the blue box, the last paragraph of the introduction is a brief summary of the study that was done. The next section of many papers is the materials and methods section. However, there are some journals that present this section last. The purpose of this section is to present the details of what was done so that someone who is interested in the results can replicate or build upon the experimental or observational study. In the red box, we can see that the authors describe the location in which their study was done. This study doesn't really have materials to describe, but in an experimental study, the authors may describe which company they ordered their reagents from, or which exact brands of equipment they used. In the blue box, we can see that the exact procedures are described in fine detail. This is also a chance for the researcher to describe efforts that were done to minimize biases and demonstrate good experimental practices. For example, these authors used a variety of walkers at different heights, randomly allocated to their treatments to reduce any bias that may be caused by accidentally using taller people in one treatment and smaller people in others. In the purple box, we can see the researchers describe the exact methods that they used to measure a variety of different metrics in their protocol. They also identified which author performed the direct measurements. In this case, it was Jessica Bryant. This, in addition to the acknowledgement section, is what leads me to guess that she was a student of Peter Banks. In the green box, we can see that the researchers conducted a power analysis, like we learned about earlier this semester, to determine how large their experiment had to be. They specified the effect size they wanted, 20%, and then calculated the sample size required. The pilot study samples mentioned would have given them estimates of the noise in their data to go into the analyses in the same way that we made assumptions about the variance in our power analysis calculations for the t-test. The methods section also includes the statistical techniques that are used because statistics are a method as well. In the red box, we can see that they were able to eliminate some factors from further consideration because they showed no significant relationships with the metric. 
In the blue box, the researchers describe using an ANCOVA, which is an advanced technique that essentially allows you to do an ANOVA when you also have a correlation going on. In this case, because days with higher wind speeds reduced the number of birds they saw, they had to take that into account when they were comparing the number of birds they saw in their three different treatments. The ANCOVA allows this. In the purple box, you can see the researchers testing their data for normality and equality of variance, which they call homogeneity of variance, using the Levine's test. In this class, you have learned Excel and R. These researchers used SAS. You can see that they did a number of tests to determine whether factors that may have been important were or were not, and then eliminated the ones that were not significant, as indicated by p-value larger than 0.25. Finally, in the green box, we can see how the researchers were able to eliminate possible confounding factors and were therefore able to use the ANOVA technique. There are lots of complex statistical techniques available, but if we can use a more straightforward technique, one that is more easily understood by a wider audience, then we generally prefer to do that. Now we finally get to the results section, and it generally starts by presenting the most interesting and important result first, so that it doesn't get buried among all the other results in the section. For this paper, we can see that they identified dog walking as reducing the number of birds observed relative to the control, both in terms of number of individuals and in terms of number of species. If you look in the parentheses, you can see that they're doing ANOVA calculations, which generate those F calculated values of 14.73 and 10.76, and they are reporting the p-value of their tests. They follow this up with a description of non-significant results. In this case, there was no significant interaction between how the birds responded to dogs and whether or not the parks tested normally allow dogs. And that's an interesting observation. The birds don't seem to get habituated to the presence of dogs, they're equally scared away by dogs whether or not they're used to seeing them. One thing to keep in mind about the results section is that just data is presented with minimal interpretation or discussion, although this is where most of the figures go. The data goes here, and descriptions of the implications of what it means goes in the next section, the discussion section. As mentioned, the results section is where most of the figures will be. Figures are very important, but they're often limited in number by the journal. Figures are particularly important because many people will read an abstract of a paper and then look at the figures before deciding whether to continue and read the introduction or discussion. Figures should therefore be good to maintain their interest people also tend to remember good figures much better than text descriptions of significant results. You can see here that the figure they included uses white, gray, and black instead of colors, which is good. They have created a very straightforward bar chart that illustrates their results clearly. It's very obvious from looking at the y-axis that in both parks that allow dogs and prohibit dogs, the number of birds observed and species observed decreased relative to the control when people were walking and even more so when people were walking with a dog. Note that the figure includes error bars, and the figure legend is very clear that these error bars represent standard errors from the ANCOVA. When making a figure, you should always say what any error bars represent, so that no one misinterprets standard deviation, standard errors, or comparison intervals with one another. The last major section of a paper is the discussion or conclusion section, and it generally begins with a clear statement of the most important major result as shown in the red box. Once the major result of this particular study has been described, the discussion should include references to other studies to put the conclusions into context and relate what was done to other work. In addition to being good scientific practice, this serves two pragmatic purposes. First, it shows any reviewers and readers that the authors know their subject material and are appropriately crediting others in the field. Second, these citations can act as a guide to readers of the paper to help them learn more about the field and other similar studies. Towards the end of the discussion section, you have a little bit of latitude to speculate on what your results might mean and present novel ideas of your own. And at the very end, we will often restate the main conclusion or the main implication of the study, as shown in the blue box. The end of the paper also includes information about various permits and ethical reviews, as shown in the purple box. Most papers also include an acknowledgement section, as shown in the green box, which thanks individuals who've helped, but were not central enough to the completion of the study to merit authorship on the paper. For example, these authors thanked various park services for access, and individuals who volunteered to walk ahead of Jessica as she counted birds. Note that it appears her parents were two of the main volunteers. After all this, we should remember that no paper is perfect or the final word on the topic. 
For example, if we think about how this study was done, Jessica was almost certainly not blinded to which treatment was being done when she walked on the path and counted the birds. She probably met the volunteers in the parking lot before starting and would know whether or not they had a dog with them. Who knows whether an unconscious bias may have influenced her recording of bird individuals. But rather than being overly critical, we should recognize that every study performed is a metaphorical brick in the wall of science. Science is a cumulative exercise that has been conducted by thousands of individuals over hundreds of years. And since you're listening to this, you're taking the first steps to joining this global and historical club of men and women who have helped all of humanity understand nature better and reap the rewards of that understanding. And we all owe much to those who came before us. In the words of Isaac Newton, if I've seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And the papers that those scientists write are what we use to help see further. And the papers that we write are the ones that will help others see further in the future. I hope you find this useful, and this helps you in your future studies as you read scientific articles for upper division courses, and further on in your career when you read scientific papers to help keep up with the changes in your field. The ability to read scientific papers is genuinely one of the most important skills you should try to acquire during your time as a science student. Science changes so much and so quickly that you will need to have the ability to understand new discoveries as they are made. Instead of just accepting the word of persuasive pharmaceutical salespersons or your colleagues, you owe it to yourself to have the ability to critically assess new discoveries as they're reported in the scientific literature.